This program is made possible in part by a grant from Charlotte Metcalf. Some Americans will be able to enjoy their golden years. Others will not. Today's guest argues that the biggest factor determining which side of that equation you fall on is your socioeconomic status, that combination of education, income, and occupation that determines your social standing. She's Deborah Carr this week on Story in the Public Square. Welcome to Story in the Public Square, where storytelling meets public affairs. I'm Jim Lutis from the Pell Center at Salve Regina University. Alongside me is my friend and co-host, G. Wayne Miller from the Providence Journal. Story in the Public Square is an effort to study, celebrate, and tell stories that matter. To do that, we sit down every week with the best storytellers around, authors, filmmakers, scholars, and more, to make sense of the big stories shaping public life in the United States today. To help us this week, we're joined by Deborah Carr, a professor of sociology at Boston University. She's also the author of a new book, Golden Years, Social Inequality in Later Life. Debbie, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for having me. So I don't know if it's a myth, but I think that most Americans want to believe that they're going to finish their working lives and they're going to enjoy this, this, this golden period of their life uh, where they don't have to worry about the day to day and they're able to do whatever they want to do with their lives. How much is that myth and how much of that is something that people can reasonably hope for? You know, it's both myth and reality. And the story of aging really is a tale of two cities. It's kind of a best of times and worst of times. And for a million of Americans, you're absolutely right. Old age is filled with good health, a comfortable home, relationships with grandchildren, hobbies, travel, golf, all of the things that you see in pharmaceutical ads, for instance, <laughs> at the 6 p.m. news. But for millions of older adults, their experience is the complete opposite, and we don't see these images on the 6 o'clock news. These are the 6% of older adults who are homebound, who haven't left their home, the millions who live in poverty, those who are homeless, those who are incarcerated, those who suffer from poor health, those who are socially isolated, who don't have friends or family nearby. And these older adults in that latter category really are in the millions, but we don't think about them or see them on media images or even see them in our neighborhoods because our neighborhoods are so stratified. We spend our time with people just like us, and so those older adults who are on the margins are really out of our sight lines. So this is really about social uh, socioeconomic status. It really is. Socioeconomic status is a big part of it. And that's kind of a jargony term that sociologists use, but socioeconomic status encompasses a lot of different ingredients. One is education. How many years of school do we have? What quality of jobs have we had in life? How much money do we have in the bank? How much money have we earned? And these seem like kind of boring, dry concepts, but they shape every aspect of our lives, including access to health care, um, whether we cope with stress through smoking or going to yoga class, whether we work in dangerous conditions or safe conditions, whether our neighborhoods are near incinerators or whether we have lovely trees and parks nearby. So the economic and educational resources we have provide us either lavish benefits or real detriments that take a wear and tear on the body as people get older. So what is society's obligation to people in socioeconomic categories that have negative outcomes, the people that you're talking about who live in areas that are not the best parts? whose health is declining. I realize that's a very broad mm -hmm. question, but is there not a social obligation, a, a compact with government, between government and citizens? I think there should be one, and in many ways there is. I mean, Social Security and Medicare is one part of it. And I think that's something important to raise in talking about late life poverty. Um, late life poverty today, on average, is better than it was in the past, right? In the 1960s, about one in three older adults lived in poverty. Due to the expansion of Social Security, that number just plummeted. It's down to about 10 percent on average. But again, that average hides the fact that for some communities, communities of color and women, poverty rates are four or five times that. And so the government 
it has played a role historically in helping to pull, pull millions of older adults out of poverty, but it's not a complete fix. Some of those fixes have to happen before someone's 65th birthday. It comes from investing in public school systems, providing jobs that pay a living wage and have health care benefits for people, safe neighborhoods, fighting climate change so that we don't have so many environmental degradations that we know hurt people who live in poorer areas. So when we think about social policy, Absolutely, we want policies that are targeted to older adults specifically and low-income older adults, but the interventions have to start earlier and broader. So w when you talk about late-life poverty, what are we mm -hmm. looking at in terms of annual income of, from all sources, be it Social mm -hmm. Security, 401K, if you have that, or yeah. what are the numbers here? So that yeah, we can that's a good question. It varies based on household size and region, but it's basically having enough money to feed the members of your household. So usually, you know, eighteen to twenty-four thousand dollars a year, depending on where you cut it. Um, but poverty line is kind of a contested concept, and I think that's that's something that I make a big point of in the book, that when we look at the federal poverty line, which again is that line at which people, given the number of people in their households, can afford appropriate food. If mm -hmm. you look at that snapshot, older adults today look like they're doing really well. It's only about 10% of older adults overall live in poverty. Again, compared to 30% if we go back four or five decades. But that neglects a couple of things. One is that when we use an alternative poverty measure, not the federal poverty line, but something called the supplemental poverty measure that economists have developed that takes into account older adults' very costly medical expenditures, that poverty rate bumps up to 15%. If we look at women of color who live alone, it bumps up to 40%. So the snapshots are helpful to give us, you know, a, a brief portrait, but when we look more broadly, that's where we start to see this fast variation in how well older adults are doing. So, so these are people with very limited incomes, and mm -hmm. you've talked about some of the issues there. It is not the financial stress of wondering if I'm going to be able to get through this week or pay the rent or pay the copay on the health care, is that not an additional burden that people have to deal with the stress, the, the physical and the mental mm -hmm. stress of stress, living it like that. Absolutely. Stress is a tremendous burden. And some stress kind of obviously makes people anxious and makes them sad. But there's emerging research that shows that stress takes a real toll on one's body, right? It speeds up the process of aging. It speeds up processes of um, problems with inflammation. It increases risk of heart disease and diabetes. So that inability to live on the income one has absolutely leads to stress, which leads to this kind of perpetuation and the health effects. And it's not just income. I think you made a good point about pointing out income. But when we look at what older adults have to live on, it's called the three-legged stool. You might have heard that phrase, the three-legged stool of retirement income. And one is what they get from Social Security. Then second is what they get from pensions. And then third is what they have in the bank, their savings. Those latter two legs of the stool are very wobbly for lower income people who haven't had that opportunity to sock away private pensions or to sock away savings. So you're right, that lack of income is a tremendous stressor. But the lack of money in the bank account that you have for that rainy day when your health starts to fall to, is even a, a bigger stressor. So one of the things that I'm interested in is, it, it, and it seems to be a, 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 a well, I don't know, a contradiction of some sort, but the 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 60s when when uh, when the uh, elderly poverty rates were north of 30 percent, mm -hmm. most working Americans when they retired, uh, well, they, I shouldn't say most, but there was more frequent defined benefit plans. You get you mm -hmm. got an actual pension from mm -hmm. your employer if you completed 20, 30, 35, whatever the the, the requirement was. Those kinds of retirement programs largely have ceased to exist. Mm -hmm. And now the onus is on uh, individual Americans to put their money into 401ks or 403bs, depending on what kind of the, what part of the economy they're working in. What, how has that shift from defined pensions to sort of retirement savings, how has that affected the kind of issues that you're looking at with, with income security for older Americans? It's played a major role. And you're right that prior to about 1970, the majority of workers, at least full-time workers, mm -hmm. often male full-time workers, had the defined benefit plan. And that's kind of what we think of as a pension plan. You know, you work 30 years and your employer pays you a lovely pension. Today, it's down to about 4% 
of companies at most offer these defined benefit plans. And now they've moved to defined contributions, which is exactly as you explained. It's like a 401k. <laughs> so you can choose how much to sock away in that each month. And it also requires a little bit of investment savvy, right? Trying to figure out where to invest. So what does that require? It requires, one, you work in a job that's a good enough job to be even offered this defined benefit as a contribution plan. Secondly, it requires having enough in the bank or enough cushion that you can put money in. If you have imminent needs that have to be paid today, paying your bills today, your health care today, you're not going to have that long range view and mm -hmm. sock it away. And then finally, just investment savvy. I mean, that's something that you're very lucky to know where to put your money. But if you're not raised in a family where you talk about investments, if that's not part of your world, it's kind of anybody's guess. So the transition has been problematic for a variety of reasons, but it's taken the largest toll on lower income people, blue collar workers who either aren't offered those plans or don't have the financial wherewithal to be able to sock away for 30 years if they have to pay their bills right now. So there are differences too by race and you sort of touched on that before. Break that down a little bit for us too in terms of where you are, in terms of your status, your economic status and your health break it down by race, there are differences. There are vast differences. And when we look at the experiences of older adults, African Americans fare worse than whites on so many dimensions. I mean, the, the most harsh dimension is mortality. They, they die younger. They die younger of almost all causes. They have earlier onset of most major health conditions relative to whites, meaning you suffer younger, you leave your jobs younger, and then you have more years of grappling with those health problems in advance. Um, but then also the economic problems Absolutely, we know there's racial discrimination in the workforce, racial discrimination in access to loans and to homes in good neighborhoods. And so blacks relative to whites have lower levels of education and income and benefits. And the most jarring disparity that you'll see in the data has to do with savings. It's a tremendous disparity of how much blacks have in assets, including home ownership, money in the bank versus whites. So there's no cushion to save for that rainy day. And these disparities really get worse and worse over time because oftentimes African Americans don't have even the financial resources of their children or siblings because they're um, subject to the same systems of racial discrimination. So it really is quite a jarring portrait. So so, where, so what do they have to fall back on? I mean, you've got Social mm -hmm. Security, you've got Medicare. Beyond that, I guess you have food stamps and some other programs, but where do you go? Very little. I mean, it is really, um, and again, it's not to say that all African Americans are poor. There are certainly well-educated, affluent African Americans. But on average, for persons of color and women's of, women of color in particular, it can be really dire. So for low-income people, they often can rely on Medicaid for their health care. There are income supplements like SSI, um, food stamps. So there are these kind of piecemeal programs, but still people are struggling. And when you add to that just other social challenges that are more common statistically in the African-American community than the white community, it gets back to this theme of stress that you've talked about. Yeah, I mean, just right. managing that patchwork of services mm -hmm. and, and, and insurance through, you know, through the government, it, it just I mean, it's stressing me out thinking about it. It is stressful, and in fact, there's new research that's coming out on this concept called administrative burden, just figuring out where to go, what to file. Yeah. That can be a full-time job, and it's often a full-time job for people who are reliant on public transit rather than automobiles. So can you imagine taking a city bus to uh, use these different services while grappling with part-time work or grandchild care? I mean, some of these pressures are really very, very acute. So why do you yeah. think that the, the, the myth of these golden years persists? Why, why, why are the struggles hidden from so many Americans? Yeah, I think a couple of reasons. I think one is that statistically, it is a greater proportion of older adults who are doing well than really doing uh, living in poverty. Um, but still, a lot of those who are doing well are right on the, the brink there, right, of falling into poverty. Another is, I think, and this is going to sound very cynical, older adults are a valuable market. It's baby boomers are 75 million strong. And marketers want to show positive images of aspirational aging. Here are things that you can buy to live well. Here are medications you can take to survive a long life. So I think there might be some kind of financial interest in putting the best image forward on the media um, in terms of how older adults are, are doing. But another is something we talked about earlier. There's a 
a little bit of denial, um, unlike the other isms of the world of racism and sexism. Ageism is something, and the challenges of aging are something all of us are going to experience mm -hmm. if we live long enough. And that's really difficult for people to face. That at some level, we all are going to start to have some of these challenges of aging. Um, but it shouldn't be a mystery because every single person, regardless of their age, has a grandmother or a great grandmother or a spouse who's grappling with these issues and they need to know, one, how to help support their loved ones who are growing old, and then two, how to try to enact some kind of social change to ensure that older adults of all backgrounds have the privilege of living well in their later years. And, and then, of course, you have the issue of the workplace itself. If you're mm -hmm. in your late 50s or 60s, even into your 70s, you may be subject to dismissal. You may not be told that you're dismissed because of your age. Mm -hmm. If you are dismissed or laid off for whatever reason, finding a job again, if you have to check that box, 65, 70, mm -hmm. you're not as appealing a candidate, despite whatever skills and institutional knowledge well, you may have. To that mm -hmm. issue, yeah. we, you know, so you and I talked about this when we did our little pre-interview. Uh, in the last 10 years, it seems to me like I see more elderly Americans uh, working jobs that once upon a time were the domain of teenage kids mm -hmm. uh, bagging groceries uh, is, is, is the is, is the probably the, the biggest passing example. out coupons in a grocery store. Yeah. What what ex what accounts for the presence of these older Americans in the workforce doing these kinds of jobs? Mm -hmm. I think between the two of you, you pointed at a really interesting paradox. There are some older people who want to be working who can't because of ageism. There are others who perhaps don't want to be a greeter at Walmart or driving Uber, but they have to due to financial need. And again, this is another one of those scenarios that there's tremendous stratification. Um, and you might have seen today, actually, a new survey came out that showed that about 25% of Americans say they're never going to retire because they can't afford it. And that's a really serious issue. And I think there's kind of two paths to working longer. One are those who want to. They tend to be healthy people who have lovely jobs, like professors and journalists who can work until they're 70 or 80 um, because it's or, a... Or TV show hosts. TV show hosts, <laughs> exactly. You can do that because it's a job that challenges us, that we feel engaged and enriched and we love it. And it's a job that matches our aging minds and bodies. But think about the people who need to work most because they need the money. Those are people who hold jobs that are not designed for aging bodies. If you're a waitress on your feet all day, mm -hmm. a construction worker, yeah. a bus driver, a Walmart greeter, those jobs with physical wear and tear, we know those are low-wage jobs. We know oftentimes they don't provide the benefits people need. So this kind of sad irony is those who need to be working the most for financial reasons are the ones who might not have the physical wherewithal to carry out the kind of jobs that they've been holding. So talk about media portrayal of older people. I mean, I, I think it's, I don't think, it is a very mixed bag. You have some mm -hmm. positive portrayals and you have some mm -hmm. negative portrayals. And this could be a very long discussion, but just talk about it in terms of TV, in terms of what you see on the screen, in terms of movies. Mm -hmm. What's out there? You don't see very many, and that's still kind of surprising. I mean, kind of the classic was The Golden Girls, yes, right? Of course. These, these a women very funny show, by had the way. a lovely life. We're, gonna not actually, sing the, the, no. we're not going to sing the theme, though. We could, no. though. <laughs> just, just so you know, folks. Exactly. As a gerontologist, when I watch The Golden Girls, I can tell myself it's work, so I don't feel guilty <laughs> for, uh, for not being at my desk writing then. But that was one that actually showed them as having kind of full lives yeah. and dealt with challenges of aging and widowhood and did it really well, but today there aren't that that many. I mean, you see some images of like three generational families like Blackish, so there are some positive portrayals, mm -hmm. but you don't see many of older adults who are suffering, and partly because we don't like to see that kind of suffering right. on television. Um, older adults are still very much overrepresented in film, in sitcoms, and television shows. Oftentimes, there are these kind of stock characters of, of the doddering older woman or the hyper sexual older man, but you don't see too many well-integrated older adults in a lot of films. There are a couple that come out that have to do with older adults and dementia that are, are very lovely films that often are done very well, but they tend not to be the big box office um, successes. Do, 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 when you think about sort of the, the, this, this suite of issues mm -hmm. and the relative political power of the baby boomer generation that has had to grapple with a lot of these issues with their parents already mm -hmm. and now are reaching the point where they are either 
at retirement, post retirement, or rapidly approaching retirement for the younger end of that, of, of, of that, of that wedge. Why hasn't this been a bit a bigger public issue? Uh, in the last several decades? Yeah, that's a great question because the baby boomers, again, they're one of the largest cohorts and they were politically active in the 60s when they were young. They have high rates of voting, so they're definitely appearing at, at, the, at the ballot, right? Older adults have higher rates of voting historically than younger people. I think part of the issue is that older adults are a very varied group. Right, And so is there one issue that all older adults would be leaning the same way on? My sense is probably not. I think absolutely most people, people of all ages actually want to support and increase support for Social Security. Social Security 2100, which is um, under discussion right now, which would be one of the largest expansion programs. But I think some of the um, programs that might attack later life poverty, that would be a different block, right, mm -hmm. than the upper middle class baby boomers. So I think a lot of older adults have very different interests, and consequently, they're not that same powerful block that perhaps they were portrayed as, in the, as young adults, right, mm -hmm. fighting the Vietnam War in the 60s. But if you look at the survey data, the vast majority of Americans of, of all age groups want to support and sustain Social Security and actually want expanded Medicare coverage. So there's attitudinal support for it, even if not wholly political support in some pockets. You talked earlier in the show about a percentage of older adults who live alone. Who, mm -hmm. who are those? And it's, I think it was 6% you said, but that in raw numbers it's a f substantial number of people. Who yeah. are those people? Yeah, it's 6% who are homebound. That means homebound. those who just don't leave their home, often because they don't have support. Then it's in the millions of those who live on their own. And the latest projected statistic for the uh, baby boomers is that 20% will be what we call an Old, an elder orphan, which is basically someone growing old without a spouse, without children nearby, without siblings. And so being alone and living alone and experiencing loneliness actually is another major issue that we care about or we need to care about. And because it affects, again, your, your physical and your, your mental health. You're absolutely. There's a clear correlation. Yeah, and that's been one of the hottest areas of research over the past couple of years, that loneliness, again, takes a toll on our minds and bodies. I mean, so much so in the UK, they recently appointed a commissioner of loneliness, really, to tackle Seriously? this as, yes, as a public health wow. issue. And loneliness is a lot of different things, right? And yeah. we have to kind of parse, is it being alone, which, again, are those who have no kin, the kind of elder orphan, as opposed to those who actually have family, but for what whatever reason, they can't marshal that support. They might be estranged. Maybe there are problems in the family dating back decades. But we do know that rising numbers of older adults feel they don't have anyone to turn to if they needed to borrow money, if they needed a ride to the doctor. And so there are real reasons that this is a, a public health crisis. One is that most older adults just actually need some help, whether it's a ride to the doctor, whether it's giving them medications. And if you are alone, and especially if you can't afford a home health aid, you don't have that support. But we know how important just emotional connectedness is in our lives, having a confidant, someone to share our problems with. That is uplifting. It helps us to put our problems in perspective. And so those of any age group, but especially older adults uh, who are alone, that's really problematic. Because um, older adults, they don't have coworkers. If they're not leaving their home, they're not going to the senior center. They don't have all the structures that younger people have to hand them a social life. I'm, I'm guessing that, that government solutions here or intervention or help varies state by state too. Mm -hmm. For example, California is probably not doing the same as another state. California might be doing more, I'm guessing. Talk about mm -hmm. just briefly the, the regional and state differences, which yeah. is geography, where, where you are, your zip code to, yeah. to break it down to that. Your zip code really matters at a lot of levels. At the most micro level, the neighborhoods we live in are linked with safety and environmental threats and whether you feel safe leaving your house. But then all the way up to the state level, there are policy differences that bear on our health. And so one has to do with simply, are there policies for family leave, for instance? If there's a state that has a more generous family leave, that means that someone, provided you have a family member, can care for you, right? For those people who aren't being cared for because their family members don't have the time or wherewithal. And so California actually is leading the pack along with New York, New Jersey, and Rhode Island and having state level policies to facilitate um, caregiving, for instance. But there are things that can be done at the policy level. At the state level, it, for those of us who have kind of lost a little bit of faith in federal um, policy making at this particular moment, states have power in what they can do for health and health care policy. So we're, we're uh, the, the 2020 
campaign is well underway. Um, are there are there policy proposals that have already surfaced that would have a meaningful impact on the kinds of issues that you're talking about? I think they can. Um, you know, the most hotly debated ones that we've heard at every debate has to do with health care. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the real hot debate is, you know, Medicare for all. And I think Medicare for all actually could in many ways help eliminate or minimize some of the problems that we've been talking about. Because even though access to care isn't going to be a cure-all, it's not going to help with all forms of stress, it's not going to stop smoking and racial discrimination and all these many problems, but it does give people access to see a doctor when they first have those symptoms. And if we can get people access to care when they first have symptoms and to engage in preventative behaviors, that is something that could help. If we think Medicare for all is too optimistic, Medicare at 50 is kind of an in-between point, right? It gets people health care, especially lower income people who have those earlier symptoms. So health care policy is something really important. But Anything starting earlier, funding for public schooling, um, making sure that all people have access to adequate schooling, affordable housing, safe drinking water, I mean, all these things that some of us take for granted that other people do not. Any investments in quality of life issues, especially those that disproportionately affect lower income people, will help them to survive until old age. Never mind have a, having a plenty old age. For some populations, even making it to 65 is a kind of a rare accomplishment. We've got about 30 seconds left. I'm wondering sort of from an individual's perspective. So we talk about big government solutions to some of these things. But if you're, if you're your mid-40s and you're looking at challenges facing your parents or challenges that you would hope to have to, to grapple with 20, 30 years from now, what should individuals be doing? You know, I think one is to talk about these issues. And I know that sounds really kind of simple, but talking about how will you save for later? How will you plan for your end of life health care needs? Who will you turn to if you're a parent who has multiple children? Maybe allocating a particular role for each child. And this isn't massive social change, but it is at the family level, figuring out what families can do to cope and to manage the challenges of aging so that they can enjoy later life. It's a great conversation. Debbie, thank you so much for thank being you. with us. She's Deborah Carr. The book is Golden Years. You should check it out. That's all the time we have this week, but if you want to know more about Story in the Public Square, you can find us on Facebook and Twitter or visit PellCenter.org. He's Wayne, I'm Jim, hoping you'll join us again next time for more Story in the Public Square. This program is made possible in part by a grant from Charlotte Metcalf.